So today we'll talk about structural design patterns. So structural design patterns are basically design patterns that work on simplifying the way that relationships are uh, made between entities. So basically the idea is, uh, is really designing the database as opposed to creational design patterns that uh, you saw last week, which was about creating objects or last class. In this uh, type of design patterns, you are basically trying to realize a certain uh, design in the best possible way. And uh, remember again, the principles of design uh, and design patterns in particular is that you want to uh, allow the flexibility of adding functionality because that is required by any code uh, through maintenance. You have to uh, be able to add functionality, but not to remove functionality. The problem of removing functionality is that uh, users are already, already using your current API and you can't remove functionality. You can only add functionality. So again, the idea of structural design patterns is how do you have the best kind of structures in your uh, design, in your class design, uh, that allows you to add functionality, but not remove functionality. Yep. So the decorator design pattern adds additional functionality to a class uh, at runtime by uh, where subclassing would result in an exponential rise in new classes. So basically the idea here is that sometimes you may want to add additional features like data fields, but uh, you don't want to have an explosion of subclasses. You don't want to, you want to minimize the modifications, but allow uh, addition of features. The adapter pattern is uh, uh, the idea of adapting from one interface that one expects to uh, a new package that has a different interface. Uh, and I will describe basically with a simple example, the idea of an adapter and usually the, what we call adapters are power adapters where uh, you, we have one cable with one power adapter and we want to plug it in, uh, in a European adapter or even a three pr uh, prong uh, electricity cable into a two prong electricity able, uh, uh, cable, you need an adapter. The facade pattern is a simplified interface to a complex text, uh, a complex uh, set of uh, tech, uh, uh, tasks. Uh, the flyweight pattern is similar to the prototype pattern, but the prototype pattern, and actually they are related. The flyweight pattern is that you have a high number of objects with common properties. And in order to save space, you keep again one copy instead of cloning that one copy you keep just one copy and then you keep additionally an array of the properties of what that different objects have about that uh, single object. The bridge pattern is probably the most complex one here when we basically have uh, two different uh, classes with a relationship between those classes like a remote and a TV and both of these will be abstracted, will be abstract classes, and then the actual implementation is done into two concrete subclasses. So the idea here is that you have actually two interfaces that are communicating, but the implementations are actually done into uh, uh, basically two, con two separate concrete classes. So both of the implementations into a relationship can vary independently. So that's the whole point that what the bridge pattern does is the, probably the most complex design pattern that we'll discuss uh, uh, in this class. So we will start with uh, the decorator pattern. That's the first design pattern that we want to cover in structural design patterns. So the idea is the following. Uh, we want to attach additional responsibilities to an object using delegation instead of inheritance. So uh, the, the idea is called decorating the object by using delegation, uh, basically a reference 
to another object of the same kind, but adding additional fields, like for instance, data fields. So it's an alternative to subclassing for, for extending functionality, especially when that delegation can be combined with every other previous kind of uh, uh, delegations of data fields. And the idea is done by wrapping the object into another, into an, another object of the same kind. And I will show you how exactly after we actually see an example that simplifies the idea how this actually works uh, uh, internally. So, and, the, and in all of these cases, when we talk about design patterns, we are talking about the fact that classes should be open to extension or addition, but close to modification. We want to allow classes to be extended to incorporate new behavior, but without modifying original existing code because that's already used by somebody. And all these design patterns that we talked up to now are resilient to change, but flexible enough to allow new functionality to be added. Okay. So let's consider this possible example. We have a coffee shop like, like Starbucks that basically you have a beverage, a abstract class beverage with common methods like get description, cost. These are basically can be abstract methods because they must be implemented by the subclasses. And then you have standard uh, subclasses of beverage, house blend, dark roast, decaf, espresso, and so on. And of course, every one of these classes implements a cost that is different than the abstract cost. So basically, and in including, we can get a description that is different. This description can be actually modified in house blend, dark roast, decaf. Expresso. So this is a standard example of inheritance. But now, as we know, if, as basically time evolves and uh, we go to Starbucks quite often, we can see that we can add additional features to our coffee. We can add milk, mocha, whip, soy milk. And then there are seasonal uh, additions. Like for instance, for Halloween, we can add pumpkin spice. For Thanksgiving, we can add cinnamon. For Christmas, we can add candy cane uh, seasoning and so on. For Easter, uh, we can add, I don't know, egg flavor and so on. So basically the idea is that we would want to have this to allow us to add additional spices uh, depending on the season. And these spices change in time, maybe something that was popular this year is not popular next year so they replace it with something else uh, and in the in the future there is not only soy milk but uh, maybe there is uh, almond milk or pistachio milk or anything that is added to this uh, to this uh, uh, inheritance so one way is to add these as fields into beverage. So beverage will have not only description, but also milk, soy, mocha, whip, uh, almond milk, and so on. Okay. Now the problem is that uh, we would like not to modify previous classes because that's the entire point. And besides, as I said, there are new uh, spices that are added, but there are also spices that are deleted. And we would do we don't want to delete. That's always the point that you don't want to delete a feature because somebody maybe use it. Maybe there is one of the million stores of Starbucks that is actually selling uh, beverages with uh, uh, some kind of spice, five spices, or uh, that is not common. Another way to implement this is to actually implement with subclassing with every single one of the possibility, possibilities of combining the original flavor with these spices. So we can have house blend with steam milk and mocha, house blend with steam milk and soy milk, uh, house blend with steam milk and whip and so on. So basically you can combine, you can use inheritance and have now subclasses. And even if we don't implement all of the possibilities, like you implement the most possible ones, 
uh, it still results in class explosion because basically you have to have for every single new flavor you have to combine it with all of the other possibilities for every single one of these specific types of coffee. So the decorator pattern actually solves this pr uh, problem in a much simpler way. We start with the original uh, inheritance hierarchy. We have beverage and the concrete subclasses of beverage, house uh, uh, blend, dark roast, espresso, and so on. Then we can also add a reference back to beverage. So the idea of this is that when you want to decorate to add an additional spice to your default coffee, all that you need to do is to actually add in this new type of beverage, a reference to the previously constructed uh, coffee. Like for instance, mocha is a subclass of beverage. It has a beverage uh, data field, which is pointing to a dark roast that was created before. This is called decoration that the original dark roast is decorated with mocha. And if we want now we can dec decorate that, we can add to that a whip, uh, whipped cream and so on. And now in addition to this, the decorator pattern also modifies functionality because when we want the cost of such a new beverage, we would ask the cost of the outer object, like for instance, the mocha. And that adds, let's say it calls the super, the uh, beverage cost, the inner class beverage cost, and it adds 10 cents or 20 cents, whatever is the uh, cost of adding this additional spice, or even it adds zero. So basically you can see here for a whip mocha dark roast, we would basically get the cost, the original cost of a standard dark roast, 99 cents, then 20 cents for the mocha, 10 cents for the whip, and the final price is $1.29. So the decorator pattern, this idea not only modifies it, it's, it's able to add functionality to uh, all of these multiple uh, uh, layers, but you can also modify the function. So it modifies the functionality. You can basically now add additional uh, uh, cents or money to, to the cost by adding the functionality uh, to every one of these layers. So you have layers like onions and ogres. And on top of that, you have uh, these additional uh, uh, features back. So how do we implement this? Basically, we modified just a bit the previous uh, diagram. So we had the beverage and beverage has description and cost and get description. Then you have the subclasses, the direct subclasses, concrete con uh, subclasses of beverages like house blend, dark roast, espresso, and decaf. You can even add more here. You can add uh, Colombian bl blend or uh, some other blends, American blend. And then you have the condiment uh, decorator which is basically this reference back to beverage. And it, here you can implement this as an abstract class and then as concrete subclasses of decorators of these additional spices. So you can have milk, mocha, soy, whip, and additionally, if you want to add pumpkin spice, it will be a subclass of condiment decorator. So let me show you how this works. So we start with the upper class beverage and the class beverage basically is the super class of all of them. It starts with beverage and abstract class. It can be an abstract beverage kind. And then we have the direct subclasses of beverage. Espresso, the concrete class, espresso, dark roast, house blend. And each of them has its own method for cost. Like for instance, an espresso is 199, a dark roast it's uh, 99 cents. A house blend is also 99 cents. And we can also have other subclasses. Then we have the abstract condiment decorator. So the abstract condiment decorator doesn't actually do anything. It's just a way to reference back to the, to the, uh, the beverage. 
So now the subclasses of uh, condiment decorator, mocha, for instance, has a reference to beverage back. And you can see here that when you create a mocha object, you create it with a beverage object. So you already have, let's say, a dark roast coffee. And now you create mocha, you add the spice mocha by creating a new instance of mocha that takes the dark roast beverage. So basically all that it does, it creates this, uh, the, refer the data field beverage is now referring to that uh, uh, object that we are decorating the, the dark roast coffee. Okay. So even every single method, if you look at it, it uses that beverage description and adds to it mocha. So it's a dark roast mocha. Uh, the cost exactly does exactly the same. It uh, takes the beverage cost of the decorated object and adds the additional cost for the mocha, for the current spice. And similarly, you do for all of the other uh, uh, spices, for instance, or not spices, but decorators. Uh, uh, whipped cream, it again contains a reference to the inner beverage, then it adds whip and it adds 10 cents for whipped cream. Similarly, for soy milk, we basically have a beverage and then we modify the description to add soy and the cost to add 15 cents to the previous cost. So how does this work? If you want just a bland espresso, you can just create a bland espresso. That's the first beverage. If you want a dark roast mocha, mocha, uh, you, can, you can add even the same object, the same uh, uh, decorator twice. You can do that too. You can basically add double mocha to your uh, dark roast and then whipped cream. If you want a mocha whipped cream house blend, you can that, do that too. This is the one that we had in that figure before. If you want a soy mocha whipped cream uh, house blend, you can that, do that too. So Wait, basically course. the idea is that instead of using inheritance to add additional features, you are actually using uh, this idea of decorating to add the additional features. So in this case, let me actually show you the example and then you can ask the question is that, so we have exactly that hierarchy that we have beverage, then we, which is an abstract class. We have all of these subclasses, espresso, dark roast, uh, house blend. Then we have the abstract decorator, which also extends beverage. So all of them, including the decorators are actually beverages. And then we have the spices. We have mocha that extends the condiment decorator that extends beverage. We have uh, whipped cream, soy milk. And then we have our main class, which creates the different beverages. And we can basically get that a simple espresso is created, a dark roast mocha, mocha whipped cream is created, a house blend whipped cream mocha is created with the price that we expect. And each price basically includes all of the decorators up to that level. Okay, questions? Um, so so um, the get description in, uh, in dot cost goes to the previous beverage? That exactly. Was? So every one of them, so basically you have this reference to the, to the previous beverage, to the one that was included in the decoration. And it's, it's exactly, if, this, if we would have implemented this with subclassing, I would have used here 15 cents plus super dot cost. But in this case, because I don't want to, I mean, the problem is that subclassing is static. You, you, you cannot create at runtime a subclass, a, a, a class, not an object, a subclass, ob, a, a subclass, something that basically adds functionality to the previous class. But in the case of a decorator, you, can, you just add function, you, you, you add uh, features to the previously created object. So you can do it at runtime. So instead of calling super.cost, I'm calling beverage.cost. So it's kind of like inheritance, what we were doing 
through inheritance, but we are doing through decoration. Does it clarify your answer, your question? Yeah, kind of. Wait, so so there's no point in using uh, the super class. There, there's no point in uh, inheritance here, right? Uh, I, I mean, we still actually there is a still a point of inheritance because we still want whatever we create to be considered a beverage. So we still want this standardizing view that we basically, when we create, in the main method, when we basically want a beverage, we want it to have the, the, uh, the standard methods of uh, beverage. So we still want get description and we still want cost. So there is still a point of having inheritance and the standard implementation of every uh, decorator is exactly like this, that you have the, the class that you want to extend, like beverage in this case, you have the concrete standard classes like house blend, dark uh, roast and so on. And the condiment decorator or the decorator abstract class is a subclass of also beverage. Because as you are constructing these objects, you basically also want them to be considered also beverages. So what we are doing, what we are doing is just avoiding having to create an exponential number of uh, subclasses of, uh, of beverage. And what uh, the way to do this is to actually add the data fields as also subclasses of our beverage class. So of our general class. In this case, and a reference back basically to that uh, beverage class. So the real point here is the fact that we can build an infinite number of combinations or not infinite, but exponential number of combining all of these features into these classes without having to create a quadratic number or even actually it's, it's exponential number of subclasses. Because you want to combine any one of these with any one of these and also add additional fields without modifying the beverage class. And the way to do it is you just add another subclass to Codiment Decorator, to the Decorator Upstart class. Wait, Professor? Yeah, go ahead. Does this like prevent you from doing like double dark rows? No, it doesn't. Uh, so, because a uh, uh, th that's the whole point. If you want uh, a double dark roast, where is a double? Like adding two dark roasts? Oh, is it yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's not possible. Okay. Because a double dark roast. So okay, that's a good. That's a good point. Okay. Uh, I guess you can add a decorator which says double or some the the count. That's a good. That's a good one. But. Usually, so okay, so I would say that if I go to Starbucks, the sizes are class, are standard. They mm -hmm. small, which is basically the small version, uh, and two or three more classes, tall, medium, and so on. So those can be included in beverage as data field because basically you don't have additional added uh, every season. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Wait, so so basically, um, decorators are only for is only for accumulation, kind of. Yes, yes, but it's also for accumulation of properties, of fields, of uh, functionality, because the best example of uh, of uh, decorators is the input output library for many different programming languages, but Java uh, explicitly. Because in Java, if you want to create a buffered input stream, the input, the, the way that you create it is you create a buffered input stream for a file input stream that was already created before. And if you want a buffered input stream that is a line number input stream, you would basically pass it in 
uh, passed as a parameter when you to the to the constructor uh, a buffered input stream as a parameter. So really, what you are doing in Java IO is exactly the decorator pattern that you want an additional feature added to the previous uh, to the previous input stream file input stream that exists. So really, what a buffered input stream is a file input stream. File input stream is just a connection to the IO that you have a reference to the file that is open for uh, uh, reading from the file system. A buffered input stream basically says you are reading in a cache uh, uh, block by block. A line input stream, it basically says, yes, but that cache for an input file is going to read line by line for a text input file. So you are decorating the previous uh, uh, input stream with additional functionality. And really, if you consider this example and you consider what's happening in, in industry with Starbucks, you would realize that you have no better design but the one that uh, it's uh, presented here. Because all the time there is a new uh, spice added to the mix or even a new uh, type of coffee. And what if you add a new type of coffee in the previous kind of design, if you had a, a new type of coffee and you want all of the previous data fields, you would basically end up with uh, an exponential number of new classes for that new type of coffee. So this is basically uh, the best design that you can have for this kind of problem. And I can give you more examples. Like for instance, if you're buying a car uh, a car has also different, uh, you, you can add additional features to the car. Like for instance, you want to add heated seats, you want to add uh, heated uh, wind wipers, you want to add uh, leather uh, chairs and things like that. It's basically the same. You have a standard set of classes that are the cars, that different types of cars for if this is the Toyota brand, then you will have Corolla, Camry, and whatever other RAV4 and so on, RAV4 and, and so on. And then you would basically add all of these different decorators on top of the basic car. And each, all of these brands have the same uh, uh, decorators. Uh, heated seats are available in each one of the brands, maybe. A question from Tim, uh, does the call for cost get description on a decorated beverage inductively call all of the, yes, yes, exactly. So that's my example here that when you call for cost, you call it for the outer object and that calls for the inner object and each one of them calls to the inner object until you are reaching those con concrete classes and then you're getting back the answer. So that's exactly what we are doing here. If I put a breakpoint, let's say for this one. So here it's a new mocha whipped cream blend. And actually, let me put a breakpoint on the next line. What happens with get description? So if you run the debugger, basically the whip description goes for the whip, the description of the, oh, okay. I didn't go in because I skipped. Let's stop it and debug again. So get description will get to the description of the class Mocha, which in turn it gets into, oops. Cost. Okay, you see the cost is the best example. So basically it goes down in the hierarchy to get the cost of the inner objects. Yes, they, they actually, of course, they exist in memory. So basically what is actually happening, you have referencing going on. So for that object three, I had a stack. Let's, let's say that this is the stack. And here I have beverage 
3. Beverage 3 is a reference to an object of the type mocha. And mocha, this object of the type mocha, has a reference beverage. Also to an inner object of the type whip. And this object has a reference beverage to an inner object, basically another object in the memory. And this one is of the type dark roast, basically the concrete type, the concrete subclass. And the same thing goes with cost. Cost is the function. So when we want the cost of beverage three, it asks what's the cost of mocha and it calls beverage cost. It goes what's the type of cost of whip, which goes what's the cost of dark roast. This is $10 on the way back. It adds uh, 99 cents on the way back. It adds 20 cents and then you get the cost of beverage. So this, that's the whole point of decoration that it doesn't only change the structure, but it also adds uh, functionality. And that actually the next example is also from graphical user interfaces. Many graphical user interfaces add uh, uh, scroll bars, horizontal and vertical scroll bars through uh, the same decorator pattern. So let's assume that you have a window and this is a interface. Then you have a simple window that has no scroll bars. And again, it's a simple window. Then you have a window decorator that implements also window, exactly the same structure that we had before. We have an interface, we have a concrete class like simple window, then we have a decorator and then we have a vertical scroll bar that implements decorator with a reference to basically the previous window. And then we have another horizontal scroll bar that implements a decorator. And if you want a, a window that has both horizontal and vertical scroll bars, you would basically create a new a simple window that is passed as a parameter to a new vertical scroll bar decorator, which is passed to a new horizontal scroll bar decorator, which is basically the decorated window with both horizontal bar and vertical bar. So this, this is used almost everywhere, this uh, design pattern. Okay. So this is the template for decorators, no matter where you basically implement them. You have a, usually an interface or an abstract class then that is implemented, it's, uh, it has a subclass, which is a concrete uh, component. Now, decorators also override functionality. So if you have some abstract methods A and B, they are implemented in the concrete component. Then you have an abstract decorator class. You can also implement directly the, the concrete decorators as being subclasses of component, but usually this is how we implement them. You have a decorator abstract class, which is a subclass of component. And then you have subclasses, concrete decorator subclasses. And now for every object, like you want method A for the, for the uh, concrete decorator A, that will call the wrapper object decorator method, uh, method A. And basically, and you, if you have multiple decorators implemented on top of each other through a delegation, then you basically will call this method A to another method A to another method A until you find the concrete implementation that returns a value. And on the way back, it adds additional values. So basically you, you construct the method A as with all of the components that were added as decorators on top of the original object. So that's basically basically the idea of the template for decorator. Very useful, very, very useful. 
Okay, any other questions about decorators? Okay, good. So next one is adapter. So uh, if you ever been to other countries like Europe, Asia, Australia, you know what an adapter is. It's a power adapter. They have different wall outlets and you have a different plug and you need an adapter to take the current for your laptop, for uh, your hair dryer and so on. In fact, I just bought two adapters, not because I'm traveling, but because I want to uh, put my Christmas lights. I have a, a three uh, uh, prong uh, standard plug and I basically want to put it in a time in a timer that every day at five turns on the lights and turns all them off at uh, eight o'clock. So the problem is that that timer is of uh, has two prongs and my lights are three prongs. So I need an adapter from three to two. And basically I had to buy it. And that's exactly the whole point of the adapter pattern. You want to convert, you have an original interface and you change maybe some hardware, which has a different interface. You don't want to change your source code, your application to use the new interface. What you can do is to use an adapter. So it converts the interface of the class to another interface that the client expects and lets the classes to work together that otherwise wouldn't work together. And this is the idea how actually drivers are implemented. So you basically, uh, almost every single operating system changes the drivers. You have to download drivers for network cards, video cards. Uh, and the problem is really that the existing system has one API and then uh, when a new, a new hardware comes, it has a new different interface. And the solution is you need a cl adapter class, something that transforms from the old API into the new API. So you have an existing system. You don't, you need to work with a vendor like a, an external library. The new vendor, uh, you want to change your library. Like for instance, uh, you change your NLP parser from core NLP developed by Stanford to Stanza developed also by Stanford, but different API. You don't actually need to change your existing system. You basically, what you need to do is to implement uh, an interface between the old API that you were using to the new API that the new library you, uh, has. So really the idea is that you need to implement an adapter. So how do we do it? An existing system has an old interface. The adapter implements the old interface, but expose is a new interface. And the existing system that called previously the old interface methods, now it calls the new adapter, which still has the old interface methods, but internally it forwards them to the new interface methods. What's good about this is basically decouples the client from the implementation of the libraries that that client uses and basically although we expect the inter we always expect interfaces to change over time but we don't need to change our application source code when the interface changes and here is an example let's assume that we had a class doc with impl which implemented an interface doc which implemented quack and walk and Quack, basically it's implemented uh, uh, by a subclass Malar duck. And we basically uh, invoke that method. So basically we had, we got the main method, a main class. We created an object with that interface duck, an inner Malar duck concrete class. And even we had methods that took duck as a parameter. So we, we want, to add a new type of animal. And since Thanksgiving is coming, let's assume that we have a new class Turkey. So we want Turkey to work in the same place where duck worked before, that we want Turkey to be assigned to X, which is of the type duck. We want to invoke test with a duck. But of course we have a Turkey. So now how can we do this? We create an adapter. The Turkey adapt adapter 
implements the old interface doc that we had on the previous slide. It, it has an inner object, Turkey, and we basically implement the method quack, but internally we, we call the method gobble. So basically, although we have a new library, we are still using from the main method exactly the same that we used before the, the object of the type doc. But, and we can have methods that have the, exactly the same signature as before. So in fact, the main method didn't change much except the fact that now we want to use the new library, but the new library is hidden into an adapter library. So the same methods that we had before can be used as they were before. Yes, uh, Kevin, you're right. We just make, made that turkey look like a duck. That's the whole point of the 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 adapter, uh, the adapter uh, design pattern. Yes, the docker. Okay. Any questions about adapter? All of these are agnostic to the programming language. This is uh, these are design patterns that are the same no matter if you program in Java, in Python, in JavaScript, or any other language. You will find them in every single programming language. Okay, the next type of design pattern is called facade. And really what facade is, is just a grouping of uh, multiple interfaces into one single interface, simplified interface. So the whole point of facade is that you have a big uh, set of interfaces and you want a unified interface, possibly uh, simplified. So there is a principle in design patterns and programming in general called the least knowledge principle, which basically says that try to, and that's the whole idea of encapsulation, try to only expose what needs to be used by somebody, okay? So the best example for this is a home theater. Uh, some of you may have tried to build such home theaters. They're quite complicated because you have to buy separately all kinds of tools like a, a player, an amplifier, a tuner, a projector, uh, lights, theater lights, a screen that goes up and down and so on. And of course, this is a very complicated process. Uh, I remember when my brother actually implemented such a, a home theater, a kind of a home theater, but it's more like a big TV with uh, different interfaces, a DVD player and, and uh, a Blu-ray Blu player and so on. It's quite complicated because you have all of these different components. Each one of them has a different remote. What people will really want is to have one single interface, one remote that when you want to watch TV, you basically uh, play, uh, uh, press play, and it does all of this. It dims the light, it uh, puts down the, the screen, it turns on the projector, it sets the input to the correct channel like DVD, it sets the screen mode of the channel, it turns on the amplifier, so now we have uh, sound, it sets the amplifier to the TV. It sets the sound surround, the volume to five. It starts the DVD player and it uh, plays. So really what a facade pattern is, is just a simplified interface to turning on something and turning off something. And it includes the order of turning on these parts and Usually when you turn off, you turn them off in reverse order because you basically don't want to burn the system. And this is similarly used for many different things. You can use it for uh, like a heating furnace. It starts first the, the vent, then it starts the, 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 the heater or the furnace and so on. So that's the whole idea. What an interface like this does, like uh, the uh, uh, 
basically the facade pattern is to group together multiple steps into one single uh, 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 class and also group the steps. So it's basically a design pattern that simplifies the creation of a complex object that has, a multi that has multiple components. So here is an example, home facade is a home facade that has all of these components. Internally, it implements the methods for watch movie and movie. And we can directly use those to watch a recent movie, The Crudes, A New Age, and end the movie when we finish. Okay. So that's the facade pattern. And it's also used for many different uses, like a computer internally is a facade pattern because you have the CPU, the memory, the hard drive, and even the creation or the starting of the computer is done by initializing the, the multiple uh, components. And then uh, the starting of the computer basically freezes the processor, loads the uh, BIOS, which basically is the main, and also loads the uh, booting uh, order it jumps to the boot address for the first uh, uh, operating system and starts executing. So facade is just the fact that you are grouping multiple interfaces into one and you also implement that algorithm that implements the startup and, and uh, uh, turn off of the system. That's what the facade pattern does. So if basically I would give you a quiz I would ask, convert, what is the design pattern that converts one interface to another? That's the adapter design pattern B. What makes an interface simpler? An inter multiple interfaces, a set of interfaces simpler is the facade design pattern. Uh, which one of these design patterns uh, doesn't alter the interface, but adds responsibility by adding features, data fields uh, and on dynamically. And that's really the decorator pattern. So, okay. The next design pattern is called the flyweight design pattern. And it is related to the prototype design pattern that we discussed last class. So let's start with a, a scenario that you develop a landscaping CAD application for some set of companies. And after using your software for a week, your client is complaining that when they create large groves of, of trees, the app starts to be slower and slower. So for instance, if you implement a game, uh, basically the game becomes slower and slower as you have more objects because you have basically uh, an algorithm to find objects in memory which tree and that basically you pay a price uh, as we know uh, complexity for finding an object is usually uh, quite high, even if you have hashing is quite high because you have hash collisions and you also want to save memory. So flyweight, the idea of flyweight is that you actually don't create more than one object. You actually create a single object tree and then you have the coordinates, X and Y coordinates and age like an array for actually the trees. So the properties of the tree. So basically this tree array is not actually a, a, an array of trees, but is actually just a matrix of the number of trees, a 2D array or a 3D array because we are, or a 2D array of three components on the uh, columns, which basically are the Y, X coordinates and the age of the tree. So the idea of the flight weight component is that you are reusing objects that you had before, but you don't even clone them. You just basically store the properties of those objects in a separate data structure. So this flyweight design basically allows a single object to be used to represent many identical instances. Uh, you basically can have a separate table or a array that contains the properties of those instances. But when you are using a method like display, you would use those properties to display the specific object. 
the benefit is really that it reduces the number of objects at runtime. You have one object for this pattern, and then you centralize the properties of all of those objects into a single location, like a table. The drawback is that once you implement it, uh, this simple instance, you will not be uh, able to have a different behavior from other instances of the same object. So display will work the same way for all of the hundreds of trees. So flyweight depends on an associate table, basically a table that basically has all of the properties for uh, the different trees. All of these trees are mapped to the single object that represents them, that one object for the tree. And this object is immutable because you basically don't have any properties inside that object. The object is just like a mirror, a empty object with, with uh, methods to actually access the data fields that are in this associated table. It's very useful for processing large documents like the web. The search engines work uh, in this way. Instead of keeping an object for every single web page, what they do, they keep an array of immutable strings, the words that appear on all of these web pages. Then they have a hash table that for every web page, these are the words that are used on that web page. Basically, you have an inverse index. From the web page, you have uh, in the, uh, uh, links to the words that are using those uh, web pages or the vice versa that you actually from the words you have references to the web pages that contain those words and usually that's what is used from the words you have references to the pages that use those words and if you want all the web pages that contain different like multiple words you do an intersection of the sets of pages for every one of those words so search engines use this flyweight uh, pattern you actually have not web pages for the page the web pages but you have you don't have objects for the web pages you have objects for the words on those web pages and then you have references or arrays for uh, tables for those web pages that contain those words so it's a standard use of the flight weight pattern and here i have a different example let's and this is actually also a very relevant example so let's assume that we want uh, to implement a coffee shop. So of course, like before coffee shops sell different types of coffee. They sell espresso coffee, uh, dark roast coffee and so on. But we don't want for every object that is created for every coffee that is given to a customer to create an object of that type of coffee. So what the way that we implement it is as follows. We basically implement coffee flavor as a class that has a name for the flavor and the rest is just constructor and accessor or two string method. Then we have a menu and a menu is like basically the factory pattern that we saw before that it basically creates a, a map from string to the type of uh, uh, coffee flavor and the lookup method, which is the factory method and also the search method that we are passing in a flavor name. And if that flavor is already in the hash table, so the flavors contains that key for the flavor name, uh, we just ignore it and we get it and we return it. But if it doesn't contain it, then we put in the flavors a new key with the flavor name and a new coffee flavor for that flavor. It's kind of like the singleton pattern that we basically create one instance of flavor name for every flavor name that we are given. So now let's say that we are baristas and we are making many orders, uh, multiple coffees, but some of these coffees are the same for basically various customers. So an order has a reference to a coffee flavor and table number. A coffee shop, has a menu with all of those coffee flavors that we saw before and the list of orders. Orders are coming one by one from basically customers. So the moment that an order comes, take order, 
we take the flavor name, we look for that specific object in the menu, flavor name, we basically get a new coffee flavor object. We create a new order for that table and for the table and that flavor, and we add it to the array of orders. So we have a list of all the orders that were created during a day, even if there are a hundred orders of espresso. So here is an example. We have a new coffee shop object and uh, we take multiple orders. We take an order for cappuccino for table two, frappe for table one, espresso for table one, frappe again for table five, uh, for table eight and so on. So as you basically see here is we only create once an object of each one of these kinds, but we can basically have multiple orders with those objects that we created, those flavors that we created. So I have an example of this coffee shop and oh, I should have just run it. Oh yeah, I did. I know this is not coffee shop. This is coffee shop. Okay, so here you basically see that I served all of those objects that I had in the main method. But if I want to actually print the report, how many different flavors were actually printed uh, were created there were actually only three flavors so although i sold many orders approximately 12 orders uh, i basically only created in memory three objects of those flavors that are in common there frappe cappuccino and espresso so that's the idea of uh, of uh, the flyweight pattern. It basically creates one object of each and then uh, reuses them into a different class. Like in this case, this array of orders, which basically are the individual orders, but for the different flavors. Okay. That's the flyweight pattern. It's very, very similar to prototype, only that we are not creating and actually, usually flight weight is the one that is used. So prototype, like even in the example that I gave last time that you have uh, foes into uh, a, a game, you can basically have one prototype of a foe and then create separately uh, the coordinates or the move of that specific foe, so, or bot. Any questions about the flight weight pattern? If not, let's go to the bridge design pattern. So the idea for the bridge design pattern is that if you have a relationship, and let me just draw it for you in paint, okay? So you have, let's say, a relationship between two different objects, okay? So let's say that here we have TV, and here we have remote. Okay. And you want uh, basically the TV is controlled by the remote. No, that's the whole point. You have a relationship between the remote and the TV. But both TVs and remotes are changing in time. Like basically, there are more and more uh, modern TVs. So you have all kinds of modern TVs. You have Amazon Fire TV. And this TV has new functions. You can not only watch movies in the old style by moving channels up and down, but you can also watch movies on Amazon. There is, uh, the, there are also Chrome TV or whatever it's called. Uh, so again, it's, there are new TVs with new functions. And the whole idea is that, yes, they are basically, they could be uh, new types of TVs, but you want common properties of TVs, okay? The same with remotes. Remotes are basically newer and newer and they have different properties. I believe there is a remote called uh, Fire Remote for those new Amazon Fire uh, TVs. Okay, and again, they have new properties. They have new buttons that before 
20 years ago, people wouldn't even think of having on a remote because they didn't know that there are new intelligent TVs many years after. Okay. So the idea of the bridge pattern is that even if you have very complex uh, designs, like for instance, a TV and a remote that are in some relationship, you don't implement them as concrete classes, you implement them as abstract classes. And even if they are sharing some methods like a remote calls, a setup channel to whatever method in a TV, they are actually implemented concretely by their subclasses. So really what we are doing, we are implementing these two objects that are um, rela related in a relationship, we are implementing them as abstract classes. And then we actually implement the concrete functionality in concrete classes, the corresponding concrete classes for a certain uh, brand or for a certain functionality. That's the idea of the bridge pattern. That's, this is called the bridge that instead of having two concrete classes that are related to each other through a relationship, we create this to be abstract and then we implement actually the concrete classes as implementing those interfaces, but in addition, you can have other methods specific for these two types of, uh, of uh, uh, brands. So the idea is that you have the original functionalities for a remote. So people are standardized to use, go up, go down, increase the volume, decrease the volume, uh, home or menu buttons. But in addition to that, you can still add additional functionality by using subclasses. So that is that what that is called is abstract the relationship or abstract the abstraction. So this is an original scenario where you have a remote and only the remote has subclasses. But really what we would want is to have both the remote as an abstract class and the TV as an abstract class. So now actually the implementation between the concrete remote and the concrete TV is uh, done uh, separately. And it basically, it can use the original standard functions, but it can also use additional functions. It's also a way to standardize uh, common functions for remotes or for some uh, uh, classes. Because, of course, we also want universal remotes that work for multiple different types of TVs. And again, this works in the same way. It helps in the same way. So the benefits of this structure of having two abstract classes and the relationship between them, and then concrete classes implementing actually those abstract classes, is that it decouples the implementation for both classes into basically decouples we have interfaces to the two top classes and then, or abstract methods, and then we implement the concrete met, uh, methods actually in the concrete classes. So the abstraction in the relationship and the implementation in the relationship can be extended independently. Uh, changes to the abstract abstraction classes, or in our case, the because in a relationship, abstraction is really the fact that you have a class that uses another class. So changes to either one of these is done at the level of the concrete classes below. That's the whole point of bridge. Many different GUI uh, packages are using basically this uh, bridge pattern, similar to the previous patterns that actually in, uh, before. In fact, many GUI uh, interfaces use all of these patterns that I basically described. The drawback is that you basically uh, increase the complexity. Now you implement uh, independently subclasses of all of these relationship, uh, relationship related entities. So here I have an example. We have a class shape and a circle shape extends shape with basically whatever circle data fields are, X and Y coordinates of the center and the radius. And then we, have, we want to draw this uh, shape maybe on different uh, 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 frameworks. So we have an interface drawing 
And this interface is implemented by two different classes, drawing API one and drawing API two. And you see they have different uh, writing, basically output. The idea is that now the drawing, basically the shape uh, class and the drawing class, although they are related, like you are basically drawing with the shape, the, the drawing, the shape that you want to draw, you can decouple them. So basically you can uh, create two circle shapes and then uh, you can print them with the different APIs. You can print circle one, the first circle shape with API one and the second one with API two. And I can basically show them to you. Let me return to the Java. So basically you can use different APIs for the different shapes. So we have API one and API two. So really the idea is that you have a relationship between two objects, but you don't represent them as a relationship at the, that level. You, imp you implement those two as abstract classes, and then you actually have concrete classes that create the concrete relationship. That's what the bridge pattern does. It's a little bit more complex and there are less number of places where they are used as opposed to all of the other patterns that we discussed before. Uh, really what you should do first is to recognize if I give you an example of such a, a program that uses bridge, recognize the existence of bridge and then you can extend it by implementing additional concrete classes. And that's basically the plan for uh, my final exam. I will give you examples or multi-choice questions in which I'm asking you here is a, a, a program, what design pattern does it use? And you have to recognize this is using bridge design pattern or this is using adapter or this is using flight weight. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I, I still don't quite get bridge out of all of them. Yes, it's the most complex. So, um, so I don't understand why why you why is it, does it matter to decouple? Why does it matter to abstract these two classes? Like, like so, exactly what I was uh, this example I find it the most relevant because we all know that technology changes, but uh, standardization doesn't change. So. We are expecting, here is an example, okay? We are expecting that uh, a remote has a method uh, set channel that invokes the method tune channel on a TV, okay? So every remote has a standardized interface, but now there are additional buttons added in time. Like for instance, Fire TV added a, a new button let's call it uh, Amazon movie, or in this example, next channel. But we also, we want to add this functionality both to the remote and to the TV uh, without having to touch basically the standard interface. The methods that are standardized, we want them to be standardized. And in addition to that, we would like additional methods. So, the fact that we have an abstract class for both the remote and an abstract class for both the TV allows us to add a, a new remote Fire TV that has Amazon movies and uh, Amazon Fire TV that has uh, the corresponding method. So basically the point is for the bridge pattern that even if you have a relationship that is established and maybe you would want to implement it as concrete classes, you still should implement it with abstract classes and then implement the methods uh, for those concrete classes in subclasses. Because eventually there will be an additional functionality requested by the uh, client to add additional functionalities, maybe even to remove functionalities, in which case you basically in the concrete class, you will invalidate 
whatever method was before a standard method. So the point is that for any relationship, even if you think that is a standard relationship, you should consider that there are basically, uh, there is a possibility that is uh, changed in the future. And therefore implement such relationships with abstract classes. Oh, so, so it makes it easier to add newer functionality in the future, kind exactly. of? Exactly, exactly. That's exactly the point. Oh, so, so you don't create a, a relationship between the two, like the remote control and TV, but you create a relationship with the subclasses. Internally, that's completely true. Because you know that basically that is implemented on the other side. Okay. Okay, so if that's all, we stop for today. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And uh, again, by tomorrow night, please uh, form teams. Afterwards, I will basically group the rest of the people into groups of four. Thank you.